Thank you for listening to this message from Simple Truth Gospel with Kiria, a teaching ministry that teaches the Word of God verse by verse to help you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel and good morning to you. Today we will cover a very important chapter in the book of uh, Romans and that is Romans chapter 8. But before we continue, let's have a, a, a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, the entrance of your word gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and the light unto my own part. Wherewith all shall a young man cleanse his way? but by taking heed thereof according to your own word. Father, our lives, our victory over sin, our prosperity in life are dependent upon your word. I pray today that you will give us revelation, knowledge, and understanding of your word by your Holy Spirit, that you will minister to us simultaneously. I pray that you will help us separate human doctrines from your word. Help us to understand that all things work together for our own good. Teach us that nothing can separate us from your love, regardless of the trials and the tribulations that we go through, that you have made us to be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. You've done so many things for us. We are very, very grateful, oh my Father God. And we say, oh glory, honor, power, majesty, dominion belong to you forever and ever. And uh, everybody said, in the name of Jesus, amen. My good friends, we will continue our study today uh, through the book of the Romans. Today we will cover chapter 8. Let me give you this analogy. If the whole book of uh, uh, Romans is uh, a whole meal comprising of uh, appetizer, main dish, and uh, dessert, chapter 8 is the main dish. It is one of the greatest chapters in uh, Holy Writ. Last week we covered um, chapter 7. In that chapter, Paul uh, enumerated his weaknesses when he depended upon his uh, personal effort, ability to overcome the sinful nature. In that chapter, more than 40 times he used a personal pronoun like uh, I, me, the evil that I will not do, that I do, the good that I will do, that I, 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 I don't do. So he sounded it so many times. But then in today's chapter, chapter 8, Paul introduces us to the person of the Holy Spirit. And you will see Paul refer to the Holy Spirit here uh, more than 20 times. The place where we will help get the help that we need to overcome our old sinful nature. So I urge you to buckle up your seat beds as we are ready to take off now. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I read to you verse 1. Therefore, there is... There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but are according to the Spirit. A Christian is someone who have met Jesus Christ, his or her Lord and Savior. Someone who has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Anyone who is a Christian can never again be condemned to eternal damnation, which means hell. For the simple reason that Jesus Christ himself has already, was already condemned for us. 
The Bible says, uh, For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that will be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Which means Jesus Christ himself was made sin, condemned for us. He pleased the Father to bruise him on our behalf. He suffered for us, so and he tested death for every one of us. So there will not be anything like a Christian going to hell. No. Now remember, uh, uh, look at what it says here. It does not say there is no failure or no mistakes. Even though there will be uh, temporary consequences for a Christian who uh, uh, misses the mark, but they will not spend eternity in hell. The only judgment that a Christian will face is called the judgment seat of Christ or the bema uh, uh, seat of Christ. Remember, this judgment does not happen in hell. It happens in heaven. So the Christian is already in heaven. It is a judgment when Jesus Christ is going to reward us for what we did while we are here on earth. It is a day when we're going to receive um, uh, uh, rewards or the day when we're going to lose rewards. It is also believed that the second part of this verse that I read, who do not work according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, was not in the original manuscript. You know, expositors and Bible scholars believe that uh, somewhere along the line, this uh, uh, section was added to verse 1. Because if you look at it this way, if you put this in here, it means that you are looking inward instead of looking upward while your strength to overcome uh, the sinful nature is. So it is believed that... Uh, uh, this actually belongs to verse 4. And we're going to see it once we get to verse 4. In uh, verse 2, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Remember here, it is not talking about the, uh, the laws of Moses. No, that's not what he's talking about here. He's using the law here as a, uh, a driving principle, if you put it that way. Uh, for example, you have the law of gravity. It, 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 it's, it's just similar to that. In essence, what he's saying is uh, um, the power of the Holy Spirit of God that now dwells in me has given me victory over my old sinful nature. That's what he's talking about here. So, as we read along, we're going to see the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God in us today. So, a lot of them, remember the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Jesus Christ said that he is our comforter, advocate, helper. Uh, that he's the one that's going to take hope together with us against the forces of darkness coming against us. That he will lead us into all the truth. He will teach us all things and he will bring to our own remembrance the things spoken to us in the word of God. So here we have already seen one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit of God in us. The, uh, he will, uh, the, the power he will em empower us to have victory over our sinful nature. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 3, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So you see that verse here, the verse I told you about in verse 1 is here now. So what is he saying here? 
You know the purpose of the law. We said it so many times in these programs. By now, I know you must be, <laughs> you must have committed the purpose of law to memory. So, the purpose of the law, the law was not given to make you righteous. It was not given to make you, uh, 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 to give you victory over your sinful nature. Rather, the law was given to bring you to the end of yourself. In that place where you acknowledge that you cannot do this by yourself, that you need someone to help you, and that's what the law does. Then the law will point you to that one who can do it for you, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He continues to tell us here, he says, Jesus Christ is the one that made us righteous, not the law. The law couldn't. Now he tells us how Jesus Christ did it. He did it by, he became the propitiation for our own sin. He became our mercy seat. He became the one who was punished by God in our state. Remember uh, that our Bible says that all of us have gone astray. Uh, we have turned everyone his own way. Uh, but God has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was the one that he pleased the Father to bruise. Jesus Christ suffered for our own sins. This is how he was able to make us righteous because there was an exchange that happened. He took our sins and he gave us his own righteousness. <laughs> for the simple reason that uh, when God looks at a Christian, he doesn't see your shortcomings. He doesn't see your um, mistakes. What he sees is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God nor indeed can be so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God he talks about the war the war that is going on you remember that uh, the day that you got born again, your old sinful nature died and uh, was buried, uh, which uh, baptism symbolizes. But this old sinful nature is one that doesn't want to uh, uh, be kept dead. Every now and then he wants to crawl out. He wants to come out again to live. And now you also have your, oh, your own new nature. That new nature, the Bible says, it was recreated in holiness and righteousness. So now there is a war going on between two of them. And this war is determined by you. Who's going to win this war is determined by you. Depends on the one you feed. So he's telling us here, he says, if you feed this old nature, your old mannerisms and conduct, if you feed, is going to um, uh, lead you to the things that are not pleasing to God, which will have uh, consequences. But if you will depend on the promptings and the leading of the Holy Spirit of God that is now one with your spirit, that uh, you will have victory over this sinful nature and you're going to live a life of peace and the life that is pleasing to God Almighty. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the way to go, to depend upon the power of the Holy Spirit of God to put the sinful nature where he belongs. We are now in verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. 
And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. There is a change that took place the day that you got born again. Like I've said so many times, the day you got born again, your old sinful nature died. You were dead to sin and to the law. But something happened. The same day, the Holy Spirit of God moved in you. He took his abode in you. Remember that uh, the Holy Spirit of God is the one that recreated your spirit the day that you got born again. Because the Bible tells us that those that are joined with the Lord are one spirit with him. And uh, by one spirit are we baptized into the body of Christ. So it is the Spirit of God that baptized us into the body of Christ. And the Holy Spirit did not baptize us into the body of Christ and uh, took off. No, he, he didn't. He stayed. So now he lives in the, in the heart of every Christian. So who is a Christian? The one that has the Holy Spirit living in him. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit does not live in the heart of those who are not born again. He can be around them to convince them that they need a Savior. But he doesn't move in until they make that decision to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And the Holy Spirit moves in to stay. So that's what he's telling us here. He tells us something here that is a little, uh, that is completely different. Another ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. <laughs> I told you that we're going to see uh, a lot of the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God in every believer. It is up to us to take advantage of his ministry in our lives. This ministry is available, but we must uh, dial in to able to receive and take advantage of the work of the Holy Spirit of God in us. He says that the Holy Spirit of God is the one who's going to quicken our mortal bodies. What is he talking about here? You remember on the day of rapture, you're going to pick up your body. Everyone who is dead is going to uh, be raised to pick up, be reunited, spirit and body. And that, that, that body is going to be glorified. It's not going to be the same body that was buried. If, if it is buried in, uh, in, 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 it is buried in one form and then it's going to be raised in a different form. The Bible tells us it is that day that uh, uh, mortality is going to put on immortality and corruption is going to put on in corruption. So the Holy Spirit of God is the one who's going to quicken your mortal body. So that day you will receive a body that we call glorified body. The body that Jesus Christ has today, even as I speak to you. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This day is coming. I am so excited. This day is coming. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit to, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So it says that you have no more obligation to your old sinful nature. You are now dead to sin. He says, don't feed him anymore. He's dead. Keep him dead. But uh, he doesn't tell you to do it without telling you how you're going to do it. This is the beauty of the gospel. He tells you something and then he tells you how to do it. He says, the way to put the sinful nature, the place where he belongs, dead and keep him dead, is by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what he says. 
But it, it tells us something here. That we are going to be partakers. We don't sit down and say, Holy Spirit, everything is now up to you. Do what you got to do. <laughs> no, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to push you. It requires our cooperation, our participation. You see, the Holy Spirit is there to give us the promptings and the leading. But it is up to us now to yield to what he's saying to us and then put those things to work. The empowerment is there already, but we are going to be the one to yield to that empowerment so that we can be victorious over our sinful nature. So now we see another uh, ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. He takes hold together with us <laughs> against the sinful nature so that we can have victory over him. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So now you see another ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. The ministry of guidance. Jesus said that he will lead you into all the truth. That's guidance. Now he tells us how he does it. You see, our visions, having visions are Bible principle. It is in the word of God to have visions, to see visions. But we do not go chasing visions. If you do that, the devil and his demons will accommodate you. The Bible tells us that Satan is able to turn himself into an angel of light and uh, his uh, ministers into ministers of righteousness. We don't go chasing after audible voices, even though it's biblical, but we don't go after audible voices for the same reason that uh, the enemy will accommodate you. How does the Holy Spirit of God guide us? How does he lead us? He leads us by that still, small voice that is within us. Remember, he lives inside us. And that's where he will communicate from. That still, small voice within. He will lead us by peace. The Bible says, let the peace of God uh, uh, reign or rule over your heart. Let it be like the umpire, the one that calls it. You see, the Holy Spirit of God is in us. And, uh, and uh, there is that peace that comes from him when you are about to do something. There will be peace. You know, that this is the right direction to go. I call it a green light. The Holy Spirit will pro provide that green light within you, telling you this is the way to go. And there will also be that uh, uh, unpeacefulness in you. When the Spirit of God is not directing you to go that route, I call it the red light. This is why it is very imperative that we have a communication, relationship with the Holy Spirit of God. He is a person. He hears. He knows what's going on. So we have to make the commitment to always improve that relationship with him by recognizing that he is in us and uh, engaging him in our conversations, in our decisions. We, we, we got to ask him first. Dear Holy Spirit of God, I need your guidance in this area. Uh, uh, should I go this way or should I forbear? And the Bible says he's, he, he, he's there to help us. So he will guide you into all the truth. And he will teach you all things. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My good friends, if you have not been uh, doing this, if you have neglected the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in you, 
you, you can start today. You, you can begin to make amend today and uh, engage the Spirit of God in all the things that you do, whether they are big or even in the smallest detail. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 15, he says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory. Hallelujah. We see again the, an, another ministry of the Holy Spirit. I told you we're going to see the ministry of the Holy Spirit in all <laughs> throughout the chapter today. So another ministry of the Holy Spirit of God is the ministry of revelation. Remember, Jesus Christ said the Spirit of God would take what belongs to him and show it unto us. Here he's telling us that uh, the Holy Spirit will give us that revelation that we are now children of God. That is inward revelation. A witness within us. He tells us that we are not, we are no longer under law. Because you remember that law brings fear. Those who are under the law, they are always afraid of the consequences when they break the law. So the Spirit of God says, We are now children of God. We should not be afraid. We are no longer under the law. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of sound mind. For where the spirit of God is, there is freedom. So he says to us, you are now children of God. And because you are the children of God, feel free to address him as Abba. <laughs> you know, the word Abba is an Aramaic term, which means father. It's an intimate term. A, a, a term that depicts uh, closeness, oneness. Before you got born again, the relationship between you and God uh, was uh, uh, God and uh, human. But after you got born again, it becomes uh, God and uh, his children. Very, very good thing to catch. So this is why we can come boldly under the throne of grace and call him Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, I have come. Your, your son is here. We are now adopted children of God. The Holy Spirit uh, gives us another revelation here that uh, the thing that belongs, the thing that belongs to Christ now belong uh, 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 to us. Because we are now joint heirs with Jesus Christ. He tells us that the thing that Jesus Christ received by divine uh, nature, we now receive by divine grace. They belong to us now. So you are no longer uh, uh, that one that is uh, uh, afraid to approach the Father God. Now you come to him <laughs> in boldness and in confidence. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Holy Spirit gives us another revelation here. He talks to us about uh, the future glory. <laughs> you see, not only that we are partakers with Jesus Christ of everything that belongs to him, we also partake in his own glory. That's what the Bible says. He says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. It is glory for our light affliction, which is only but for a moment, but was for us exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look at the things that are not seen,
I'll take that again. He said, when we look at the things which are seen, we don't look at them, the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. For those things which we can see, they are temporary, but the things that are not seen, they are eternal. So he's talking about the future glory, the glory that will, that, that will be revealed in us. The Holy Spirit gives us this revelation now that this glory belongs to us. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are in verse um, in 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the, for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with bad pains together until now. So here, Paul begins to talk about the consequences of uh, the failure of Adam and Eve. You see, when Adam fell, creation fell with him. A curse was put upon creation. And even up to today, creation is uh, waiting for this curse to be lifted. We see this in the aging of our planet. And uh, we see what people call a global warming. We see severe weather conditions. Because the creation is under curse and is aging. But we understand by Bible prophecies that um, this planet, this earth, will receive a first lift during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ from Jerusalem. This time when we are going to rule with him from Jerusalem, at a time when we will have our uh, glorified bodies. So, even though the creation is now groaning, they want the cause to be lifted up from them, but it is, the time is coming when this will happen. And uh, 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 during the millennial reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, this is the time that we will see that taking place. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 23, not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in the hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with our perseverance. You know that the Holy Spirit of God is a test of what heaven will be like. The Holy Spirit of God in us is a test of what heaven will be like. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is a down payment uh, that God put down to show that he has made a purchase. The down payment he put down when he purchased his inheritance, the Holy Spirit of God. We, just like the creation is groaning, waiting for the curse to be lifted, we also, we are groaning for our glorified body. We are waiting for it. The Bible tells us there is a day when we're going to pick up our glorified body. The day of the rapture of the church. 
There are so many Christians who don't believe this, but that's what the Bible says. It says that the dead in Christ shall be raised, and we who are alive and still remain shall be caught up to meet, uh, uh, shall be caught up with them in the cloud to meet with the Lord in the air. The Bible tells us that uh, it, that mortality will put on immortality, and corruption will put on incorruption. It's talking about the glorification of your uh, uh, bodies. That's what it's talking about. We know that uh, when this earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building of God not made with hands eternally in the heavens. There is a day when that trumpet will sound. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you excited? Are you waiting for that day? It's imminent. It can be any time. So, when that trumpet sounds, this is the day that I will, will be, anyone who is in heaven is going to come down here to pick up their glorified bodies. This is the day that we are waiting for. And as Christians, this is one of the blessed hopes of the church. I believe in it 100% that it must come. And the reason why I believe in it is because uh, uh, God will always watch over his word to perform it. If he says he will do it, he will do it, for he's not a man that he should lie. I believe it because forever the word of God is settled in heaven. I believe it because God upholds this universe by the word of his power. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not pass away. This is why I have confidence that if God says he will do it, he will do it. This is why I rejoice every day, waiting for this event to happen. And it must happen. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. How now he who searches the heart knows what the, what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So here we see uh, another ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. The ministry of helping us with our in our prayers. Remember that uh, when you pray in tongues, in other tongues, it is the Holy Spirit of God who gives you the utterance. We see this on the day of Pentecost when um, the disciples spoke in tongues, and the Bible says. Uh, they, they spoke as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men, but unto God. How be it? He speaks mysteries. He speaks wonders. He speaks secrets. No man understands him, but it, because he's talking to God. So, there are times in our lives. There are situations and conditions that we don't know how to, what to pray for. Remember, the Bible doesn't say we don't know how to pray. We know how to pray because we pray to God in the name of Jesus Christ. But uh, what to pray for, sometimes we don't know. We don't have all the details. We don't have, uh, uh, we don't understand the condition ourselves. We don't know what the will of God is, is for that particular situation. So we don't know what to pray for. This is the time you get on your knees. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you pray in the Holy Ghost. You pray in tongues. This is the time that the Holy Spirit of God will take hold together with you. Remember, when prayer reaches its climax, words are no longer possible. This is the time that the Holy Spirit of God takes hold together with you. And you hear that groaning. You hear that groaning. 
you are unable to speak words. Now it is only signs. It's only groan, groaning. That's, that's the only thing going on now. It is the Spirit of God taking hold together with you. Understand that the Holy Spirit of God does not pray for you. He doesn't do your prayers for you. You are the one who's going to do your prayers. Don't go home and sit down and say, I'm not going to pray anymore because now the Holy Spirit prays for me. No, he does hold together with you. That's why he is there, a helper. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, have, we are now in verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For who he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 28 is a, I believe, is a live verse for so many people. A lot of Christians have committed this verse to memory. What is he saying here? He's saying that uh, in our Christian work, there are so many things that we don't understand. We don't know. We don't. But he says that instead of Focusing on the things that you don't know, focus on the things which you know. And here it tells you what you know. He says, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. We are sure of this particular one that all things work together for good. So, in our trials and in our tribulations as Christians, we have to trust God. The reason that we trust God is that uh, he is omniscient. He knows everything. You see, known unto God are all his works from the uh, creation of the word, from the beginning of the word. And all things are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He sees the end from the beginning. And we don't have this attribute in us. So this is the reason why in our trials and in our tribulations, we must understand that we have to trust God who knows everything. That is the reason why we are going through trials and tribulations. But we have to know that even though we are going through trials and tribulations, it is going to work out for our own good. Sometimes God's good may not seem good to us at that moment. Yes. But somewhere down the road, <laughs> when we come to the awareness of it, we'll, we'll, we'll thank God and say, God, I thank you because you allowed me to go through that process. Because that process strengthened me. That is the reason why I'm here today. Understand, because sometimes uh, uh, we Christians, we only memorize verse 28. And we don't add verse 29 to it. Remember, you have to take it in context. Uh, the chapters and verses and verse uh, division in the Bible was not done uh, until around uh, uh, 1227 by Archbishop uh, Stephen Lampton, the Archbishop of uh, uh, Canterbury. He was the one that uh, divided the Bible in chapters and in verses. But up till then, the Bible was just not divided in that manner. So when you're reading the Bible, it's very important that you read it in context so that you will get the right emphasis. So sometimes we don't add verse 28 to it. Verse 29, I mean. So if we add verse 29, let me read verse 29, then it will, you will understand it in context. For whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 
So the reason of all things working together for your good is for you to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what he's saying. It is for you to be molded to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not going to be for your own selfish interest. But it's going to be for, the, for that purpose of you becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse uh, 30, I believe. And, and, uh, and, uh, and when, when, while you are going through your trials and tribulations, remember I said, trust God. Trust God because God's, his words will never change. He says, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything impossible for me? Look at God in that perspective, with, in that direction. From that perspective, look at him. The one that says, I am your helper. The Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what can man do to me in Hebrews chapter 13. So that's the way we look. We know that the king of kings, he is in charge, he is in control. He sits upon his throne. <laughs> and regardless of what happens, <laughs> it's going to be for your own good. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord in verse 30. Moreover, whom he predestinated, he, this he also called. Whom he called, this he also justified. And whom he justified, this he also glorified. So now he begins to talk about what we call divine election of God. A very, very controversial principle in, uh, in, uh, in Christianity. Uh, there are so many people who don't believe in divine election. Divine election means that uh, uh, God, uh, uh, because he's omniscient and he knows everything, so... He knows those who will hear the gospel and receive it, and then he, they are predestinated. So he called them into his kingdom. So there are people who will say, if God is the one that makes the choice, who comes in and who doesn't come in, so why should I west, uh, try to? Uh, why should I try to be saved? And these are the people who get pre, uh, divine election wrong, the concept wrong. So let me explain to you why uh, we have divine election. So, like I said, divine election, because God is all-knowing. He sees the end from the beginning. He knows from the beginning that uh, those who will hear the gospel and those who will come to Christ, so based on this knowledge, he justified them. He glorified them. The Bible talks about some, something in the future here as well. You can see here, it says, uh, you also glorified. When I look at this body that I have here, I said, no, it's not yet glorified. <laughs> if this is what glorification is, I don't want it. <laughs> but remember, he's talking about something that he has already seen. He sees the end from the beginning. Now, the glorification he's talking about here is your glorification of your body, which will happen on the rapture day. But God has already seen it, so he talks about it as though it's already passed. In Bible prophecies, that's, that's what we see. God talking about things uh, as though they already passed. And these are things that are supposed to be in the future for us. Understand that divine election of God must be accompanied with uh, human volition. Human volition means that you are the one who's going to make this decision. Because God created you and I as free moral entities. He gave us the right to make choices in life. And he will not restrain our choices in life. So because of this, you are the one who's going to hear the gospel and make the decision to come to Christ. 
Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you will confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you should be saved. So you are the one who's going to make this uh, decision. So there is a balance between uh, divine election of God and human volition. So some people believe in one or the other, but I believe in both. <laughs> because the, the, the uh, combination of both is what brings you to salvation. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse uh, 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also reason, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So we live in a fallen world where we face uh, daily opposition and, uh, and trials and afflictions and oppression. It's inevitable if you live in this world and you are a Christian. It is not, you cannot uh, escape it. It's part of your Christian package. You'll be persecuted because you are a Christian. People will come against you. They will challenge you. They will malign your name. But what he's saying here is, uh, who can bring these charges against you and will be able to sustain them? It's not possible. There is no one who can sustain these charges against you. Let me um, I think we skip to verse 31, so I don't want to miss a thing. I know this is a very uh, long chapter, but we go ahead and cover this chap uh, this verse. So I will read verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his only son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So here Paul is saying, everything that I have said so far, this is the summary of it. He says, if God gave us his best. He says, what, how can we compare our problems with uh, 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 Jesus Christ? God gave us Jesus Christ, the best in heaven. How can he withhold from us the little things that we go through? What, 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 what are your problems? Are we talking about uh, maybe money to pay your rent or your mortgage? Or are you looking for a car so that you can go to work? Or, or you are sick in your body? Or you are having uh, uh, marriage issues? Relationship issues? Regardless of what the problem is, he's telling us here, if God gave us the best, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he says, do you think that God is going to withhold from us these other things that we call problems? Think about it that way. Whenever you, you consider something as a problem, look up and say to yourself, there is a bigger one, one that God has given to me greater than this problem. He will also give me solution to this problem. The Bible says, do not fear a little flock, for it is the will of the Father to give you the kingdom. <laughs> he will give us. He will help us. He will sustain us. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are in verse 33. So, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, 
who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercessions for us. So like I was explaining earlier, we live in a fallen world where you go through persecutions and uh, afflictions just because you were a Christian. People will bring uh, charges against you. But he's telling us here, he says, who is that one that will be able to bring a sustainable uh, uh, a charge against you? He says, Jesus Christ is the one who was condemned for us. He has already been condemned for us. So no one is able to bring these charges against you. If there is anyone who qualifies to bring charges against you, it's Jesus Christ. But he's not doing that. Rather, he's seated at the right hand of God, interceding for you and I every day. So my good friends, let me give you this wonderful advice. <laughs> Do not let anyone condemn you. Do not let Satan. Let's start with him, the accuser of the brethren, who goes about accusing people day and night in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, do not let him accuse you. He does not qualify. You can know the, the you, you see the, 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 uh, the, the trajectory that he's going on. Eternal condemnation. He's already condemned for eternity. So he cannot condemn you. Do not let other people condemn you. Because there are people, they're looking around, you know, finding, they are sniffing out charges. <laughs> they are finding for one thing or the other. <laughs> That's what they're looking for. Looking for little innuendos. <laughs> but the greatest of them all is do not let yourself condemn yourself. I'll say it that way. Do not condemn yourself either because there are some of us we find it very difficult to forgive ourselves when we make mistakes. We beat up on ourselves. We don't let go. Even when God said that uh, if you confess your sins, he's so faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We still don't uh, uh, receive that uh, forgiveness from God. We find it difficult to forgive ourselves. The reason why we must forgive ourselves is uh, condemnation is, the, uh, is a direct access to overthrowing your faith. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, uh, the Bible says, um, if your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart and he knows everything. Brethren, if our hearts condemn us not, then do we have boldness towards God. The moment you let your heart condemn you was the time that you let your faith uh, 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 fall. So, you know that everything God made available to us by grace, we must receive it by faith. And if your faith is not working, you're going to live a, a, a struggle life. It's a big problem for a Christian. So this is why if you miss the mark, don't let the enemy condemn you. Don't let other people condemn you. Just tell it to God. Repent and receive forgiveness from all unrighteousness. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that Jesus Christ said, For God has not sent his son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus is not condemning you, my friends. David said, Blessed is the man whom God will not impute sin. He's not imputing our trespasses against us. We are now in verse... Um, 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? 
as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights or depths, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs> Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So here Paul enumerated uh, certain conditions. And also he enumerated uh, forces of darkness. And he said, none of these things is able to separate us from the love of God. At the moment when you are going through these trials and uh, afflictions and tribulations, to you, it may seem that the love of God is no longer with you. But do not think that way. Always remember verse 28. If God, he says, if God is for us, who can be against us. So, all things work together for good to those who love God. So remember that in that situation, things are still working out for your good. Even though it, 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 it may seem that you are hemmed in at that point, it may seem that the love of God is not there for you. Remember always that all things are working together for your good. So none of these things is able to separate us from the love of God. For the reason that uh, the love of God for us is not dependent upon our works. The love of God for us is uh, uh, everlasting and is unconditional. Speaking through Jeremiah, he says, I have loved you with everlasting love. We do not uh, receive the love of God because we are good people. Rather, it is grace. We receive it because of what Jesus Christ did. So the love of God, the love of God for us, will endure forever and ever. For the Bible says that it will take ages for God to unveil to us how much he loved us. So, it is very important to remember that in the situation, when you are going through your trials and tribulations, Face your trials from this mindset that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Now, what does it mean to be more than a conqueror? It is the one who rejoices while going through trials and tribulations. Because he or she understands that uh, he has victory already, that the end will be victory for him or for her. That's what it means to be more than a conqueror. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My good friends, we have fi I finished the whole chapter today. And next week, we will cover chapter uh, 9. So I encourage you also to read ahead uh, so that you, you get to say familiarize with that chapter before we cover it. I have come to the end of today's teaching. And now we are are the most important part of this teaching. The time that you will have the opportunity to be born again if you are not yet born again. If you have wandered away from Jesus Christ, now is another opportunity for you to come. Jesus Christ said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There is no other name given among men where we must be saved, if not the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. My good friends, what does it profit a man who gains the whole world and loses his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his own soul? That is nothing worth it. 
We are here on this earth as temporary strangers. It is appointed to every man who wants to die, and after this is judgment. There is a day when the soul or the spirit of a man will leave his body. And that day, there will be a destination for that spirit. That spirit will spend eternity in heaven with God. If that spirit met Jesus Christ, he is all her Lord and Savior while on earth. And that spirit will spend eternity in hell, in Gehenna. If that spirit refused to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is why we are preaching the gospel. Telling you about this situation. There is heaven, there is hell. And the decision to where you're going to spend your eternity is dependent upon when you are alive. When you are dead, it becomes too late. He that has the Son of God has life. But he that does not have the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in that one. The day that you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. There is a day of salvation. Now is accepted time. Do not procrastinate it any longer. For 150,000 people died in the world today. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to us. We don't know what it's going to bring. So we must take advantage of today and live like today is the last day for us. I'm going to lead you now in a very short prayer. Pray this prayer with all your heart and today you will be born again. And if you would die, you will not spend eternity in hell, but you will spend it in heaven. Say these words with me. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe he is your son. He died for my sins. And you raise him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life today and be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that I am now born again. I'm a child of God. And you've washed away all my sins in your precious blood. My name is now written in the Lamb's book of life. Father God, I give you all the glory for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you said that prayer, welcome into the kingdom of God. Please find a Bible-based church where they teach the Word of God and become a member so that you can be taught in the Word of God. For the only way you can grow spiritually is through the Word of God. I want to use this opportunity to thank our partners all over the world. If you want to become a partner with this ministry, please go to our website. It is kuim.org. Remember, it's only those who hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and they put their words in practice. They are the ones who get the benefits of the word of God. So be a doer of the word of God. I pray for you this day. May the Lord bless you and be with you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace of mind, even in the midst of turmoil. May he set your feet upon the rock that is higher than you. May he give you wisdom to make right decisions and choices in your life. May he give you healing in your bodies. May he open up for you doors of financial opportunities and get you out of debt if you are in debt today. I pray that his mercy towards you will be new every morning. And that he will bless the rest of your week. In the name of Jesus Christ and everybody said, Amen. My good friends, regardless of our trials and tribulations, remember, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, surely there is an end and your expectations will never be cut off. Thank you, Father. Glory, Hallelujah. Baruch Hashem Adonai. O skandal la bragen de eske disku kushko baratiti. Ina mago glosio ko pareke de baragen de seleke le predeste. Undam ne poeshe kula apa uske tala la patunt. Thank you for listening to this message from Simple Truth Gospel with Kira. 
a teaching ministry that teaches the word of God verse by verse to help you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.